Before we get started on this new campaign, I do want to take a moment to mention that we do support Kickstarter United's effort to unionize. They have not called for a boycott, and so we will continue to support independent creators in their Kickstarter campaigns. There is a link in the show notes where you can follow Kickstarter United and their efforts, as well as calls to action on how you can join in to support their efforts. And today on The Terrible Warriors, we continue with our next Kickstarter campaign with Dundas West Games' Ross Rifles. Ross Rifles is a World War I RPG following the stories of the Canadian soldiers who served in the front lines. And Ross Rifles is already funded on Kickstarter. Congratulations, everyone. Before we can even get this episode out, you've already met your goal. And now it's a race to the next stretch goal. So be sure to visit those episode details where you can find a link to the Kickstarter page and you can join in in supporting to make this game as big as it deserves to be. For now, this is our first episode in our campaign, which means being empowered by the apocalypse. It's character creation. Who will our trench busters be? Who are the soldiers that we will follow on the front lines of World War I? Who are our terrible warriors? Yes, hello there, terrible warriors. Welcome back. And we are continuing with our series of the Kickstarter specials. I'm Justin Ecock, and I am here at the table We're from Twig from the Cambridge Chronicles. It's Alex. Hello. We're actually doing a game. In person. In person. Wow. Face to face. This is, this is uh, really fun. So you're here to play with me. And I am also joined, uh, returning from our root game. You was you were here. Well, you, you were here last time to talk about Ross Rifles, but you were also part of our our, our root story with our mm-hmm. scoundrel Trixie the Lost, and and now you're going to be our GM today. Yes. Welcome back, Daniel. Oh, thank you. This is this is my first time jamming for you, so I'm excited. Oh, oh it's going to be really fun. Uh, <laughs> you never forget your first. Uh, it's and, true. Uh, here, uh, also uh, from Dundas West Games, one of your co-creators on Ross Rifles is, is it the two creators? Or is there three of you? There's, there's, there's three, three of us. Yeah, that's, yeah, what, that's what it two, sounded like. Two Daniels and a Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> two Daniels and a Patrick sounds like a Chuck Tingle setup. That, that's uh, our company. It's two Daniels <laughs> and a Patrick. And a Patrick. Yes. Uh, well, welcome here. Uh, uh, pleasure to be on. Yeah, and you're going to be playing as as one of the other players here. Indeed, yes. So uh, you'll be you'll be carrying the uh, the dead weight that's over on this side of the table with Alex and I. <laughs> that could be the episode name, just dead weight. Dead weight. <laughs> we yeah. just call it dead weight. Actually, um, <laughs> So as we mentioned last time we were talking, Ross Rifles is in Kickstarter right now. Uh, it's launched. It's ready to go. And uh, if you want to find the exact link uh, to where it is, it's in – click episode details. It's right there. Go to uh, terriblewarriors.com slash Ross Rifles. It's right there. And the time we're recording, it's mid-September. So you know, we will g- update you in the extra and in the intros on the – actual state of where things are and follow us on twitter at dice warriors where we can like hype it all up uh, but uh, here we are it's really exciting you you presented this game to me right before we were planning to play root and so i was like oh i gotta juggle things around we gotta we gotta do this this is really exciting so uh once again set up for us daniel uh what rifles is and uh, and let's just get going let's get yeah. into it for, first things first like so ross rifles obviously deals with some pretty like heavy themes Safety tools are super important. Uh, I, at minimum, like to use the X card. Are you guys both familiar with the X card? We have used the X card. We have talked about the X card, but I don't think Alex has any practical experience with it. Okay, but you know how it works and everything like that. If any of the, you know, the content of the game... Uh, is, you know, triggering to you or it makes you feel really uncomfortable. You just hold up the card. I made three X cards right here. I need to draw those X's again. They're very faint. But if any of the uh, material is like that, you, all you got to do is raise or touch the card. And whatever just happened in the game will will not have happened. And we'll move on from there. No questions asked. And with the content changed. Uh, so I had like... And what's key with the X card is it's not a condemnation if it's used. Uh, It never is. It's uh, identify what it is and either fade to black, rewind, retcon, Mm -hmm. move on, whatever is necessary to get back to enjoying the game. Mm -hmm. And it's not a judgment on anyone who introduced whatever content has been X carded. It's not a call against anyone. It's not a condemnation. It's just a signal to use so that we are all here for the same reasons and that we're all enjoying ourselves 
Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, Patrick and I have been playing games together for years, but I haven't played games with you two. Well, we, we played, a, you know, Root together. Yeah. But Alex, we've never played a game together. No, so this true. is, you know, the X card is a great way for us to kind of, you know, express our own boundaries in game two. And like, I'll have one as well as a GM. Yeah, it's nicer than just going on face with, especially if you're playing with strangers. If you're playing at conventions, it can be, I mean, it can be a deal breaker to not have something like that at the table. Uh, and uh, I, I use it at the Storm Crow Manor when I'm running games, because it, when you're meeting players for the very first time, you just, just don't know. And, uh, and, and you shouldn't be expecting expected to and it's not really fair or appropriate to have someone to volunteer up past traumas or things that she, like no like the x x card is is a, is a is a nice tool to have so that it's essentially a safe word that can be called out when uh when you're playing the game so that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know especially when you're dealing with heavier themes like we we're going to be doing with ross rifles just because our player characters are not going to be having a good time. Uh, yeah. And because they're going to be experiencing some very serious things doesn't mean we have to role play it out if that's going to be a bother. And uh, and, and that can be like games like Bluebeard's Bride uh, is another great example. That of game's a game heavy. Where you have to have a safety tool for it because you're playing, as you mentioned, Ross Rifles might not be supernatural, but it is dealing with a lot of horror themes. If anything, the fact that it's not supernatural makes it scarier. Yeah. scarier. And having, having themes of horror you, even more so, I think, requires you to consider safety tools mm -hmm. because we're we're not just playing a game for laughs like you would with masks. Like you should have safety tools and masks as well, yeah. but masks is also, it's more lighthearted and it's a little easier to navigate into content that everyone is just going to universally be in with. Whereas in a horror setting, it's, we're, we're already trying to push that line and go to places that we wouldn't default to. And an X card also gives us permission to push up to that line knowing that if we step over it, we've got an option to be able to be like, whoa, let's t step back, right? We're not going to go off that cliff. Yep. And I mean, if anybody's listened to the Cambridge Chronicles and they know me, you know, I mm -hmm. not that I don't have a limit, but I'm usually open to pretty much anything. Yeah. But this is a good tool to have. Sure, and and just sure. because you're open, yeah, and is I didn't fine, know that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, like, exactly. I was going to exactly. say like, for for me, I'm I'm pretty much open to anything, but I do like the idea of having this because you never know if somebody mm -hmm. else is affected. And by and it. and even more so, it's also it, it allows if we did not have this card at the table and we were playing uh, a game like this, or again, like when we were playing Bluebeard's Bride, we didn't use the X card playing Bluebeard's Bride, but if we didn't have the X card, there's a lot of stuff that may never have happened in that game because we wouldn't have, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't know what my players are going to react to yeah. or how that's going to happen. So you just tend to dial it back and only play at a one or a two. Next card, you can get up to a five or a six. <laughs> yeah, you 100%. Can, you can play at a higher temperature because we've got an escape shoot. Mm -hmm. You yep. know, 100%. 100%. We, uh, and I mean, Ross Rifles, we played this with like such a wide array of people that like you can't do it without safety cards because yeah. we've, we've been playing it at, I've played it at every single con that I've gone to. And I've gone to a lot of cons and like we've used it in classrooms. Mm -hmm. Played it online. Played and it's, it in the public playtests that we've done at we, we, venues we, across the city. We've played it with the military. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, like you, yeah. you mentioned, you've played with families and you've played with kids and you've played with other gamers. Right? You've you played with veterans as well. Yeah, and uh, and that that I'd, I'd love to follow up on another conversation. Yeah, we can about talk about that during been like yeah. uh, uh, meeting all these different people and their reactions to this game. Maybe we'll save that for the debrief uh, if we have time afterwards. Yeah, uh, totally. To talk about this game because I'd right. love. I'm, I'm certain after I play Ross Rifles, I'm going to have a lot more <laughs> questions that are more in context to, yeah, to the 100%. actual experience. We've done honestly, we've done so much going into this game. Uh, like Patrick and I, we we went all the way out to Ottawa. Yep. to go to the War Museum because I. Because I contacted the curator there and I was like, hey, I'm a museum professional. Um, you know, I'm also like, I'm, uh, I have a Canadian gun license. And I was like, hey, we were writing this game about the World War I experience. And we would really like to see Ross rifles in order to, you know, do it justice in this narrative. And so they were like, sure, sounds good. Wasn't expecting that it to be that He's easy. Like, yep. They were like, yep. So Patrick and I went down there. We met up with one of the armorers at the War Museum and we spent four hours yeah. in their gun vault, basically, 
handling all the different Ross rifles, looking at artifacts, grenades, uniforms, uniforms. Well, and, that, and that's and the just thing chatting. too. You're going to have people that are going to play that don't even know what a Ross rifle is. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we we made sure that was in the game. Like a lot of people were, and I think this is a testament to like a like how well laid out the quick start was. And be like how much effort we put into it. Because this is the second quick start we put out mm-hmm. and within the two year span of working on Ross rifles. And people were actually asking, like, the quick start has so much information. What's the book gonna give us? And the book's gonna give you like so much history, so much background information yep. that you can bring into your game. Um, it gives you the context. It gives you the context of uh, of, of the setting. Or if the book is telling you the rules and how to play the game is what it is now. The, the the full version is going to include, you know, what the setting was and yeah. and, mm-hmm. uh, and and help transport you to where you are, so Just, you can have a, an appreciation yeah. of where. Because like you're saying like Ross rifles, you could use this to change the setting and, and move things away if you wanted to but um that the, the intention of it is, just think about how saying. cool it would have been in like grade 10 history class if this was a unit oh in- yeah instead yeah. of having to watch the same documentaries from 30 years ago on vhs or something i'm, I'm so oh, yeah <laughs> i'm so jealous when i hear about like you were mentioning in our interview last time um of just using dungeons and dragons as an education tool and uh i mean i i came into dungeons and dragons in high school as an improv team and a teacher who was like oh well D&D is just like improv, but with, you know, dice uh, and invited us. But it was like an after school club thing to have role playing games and like tabletop role playing games, not just like LARPing and role playing, but but playing something like this in a classroom setting as an educational tool. I would have paid so much more attention. (laughs) It would have been such a different situation. So if if you're a teacher and you want to play Ross, you want to play Ross Rifles in your school and you're in Toronto. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah even more so i'll come to your school yeah yeah but uh let's make characters let's make characters mm-hmm. so this. uh patrick has the six playbooks i do in front i'm of holding them, them right here double-sided printed them yes i did Ooh, yeah. fancy yeah we we based every single playbook on you know either play testers or actual people in history or you know almost like universal experiences from the war do you want to listen to Mel patrick because you got him in front of you uh, yes, yeah, so we have six playbooks, um, starting with the sergeant. The sergeant is, you know, the person who's in charge of your section. So the game, we play a section of trench raiders from the Canadian military. The sergeant is the person who's been given the brunt of command. Now, I don't want to assume the trench raiders are these soldiers that were then sent into enemy trenches. Yes. Yes. And to to just break their support lines. Reconnaissance. And, yeah, get information like reconnaissance or yeah. destroy defenses, anything like that. Also, like, capturing Do you know the story officers. of the Devil's Brigade in World War II? Yeah, I've heard of them, yeah. They, so when they pulled, they pulled a lot of soldiers away from the front line to get ready for D-Day, for all the training, they went back into England. Mm-hmm. It also meant that the front line was relatively undefended during that time, but they didn't want to tip off that they were doing all this. So a group, the Devil's Brigade were sent in, they were only, a, you know, a, a, te- a percentage of what they were. They were like, hold the line. This is all they told them. So they would start... Each night, they would go across to enemy lines. They would take out one supply room, or they would sabotage one gun, or they would take out one sniper. Yeah, very similar to And then they would leave a Mm -hmm. sticker behind, and in German, it said, the worst is yet to come. And they would pull back. (laughs) (laughs) And they moved the front line back 150 yards before D-Day. And they found a diary from a commander that said, the devils surround us. We cannot win. And that's how they got their nickname. Um, oh, that's and, cool. Uh, I didn't know that. And it was just one of this thing. And, and, but it was, it was just this psychological campaign that they ran against them. Yeah. So mm-hmm. This is that. You're it's also going similar. out and rescuing people. Mm-hmm. Um, but not all of it is conflict. You can also, we, I've had entire play sessions where they just like sat in the trenches. I saw like Patrick, I had um, one of the playbooks is, has like a project that they're working on. And it was a kid who was playing it and they wanted to make a robot. And so they were constructing some sort of automaton out yeah. of garbage. And we'll get to that. So we have, we do have the sergeant. So yes, the sergeant, um, they bear the brunt of command, as I said. They have a lot of moves about shouldering the responsibility for the actions of their section, stuff like that. Um, then there's the creative. The creative is someone who uh, maybe doesn't really fit in, doesn't have talents that fit in in a combat situation. Um, before the war, they might have been an artist or a writer or something like that. Um, but they're just trying to contribute to the section any way they can. So we base this 
playbook mostly off of J.R.R. Tolkien's story from the war. Then there's the scrounger, which is who you just mentioned, Daniel. Um, the scrounger is the person who gets supplies for the section, and they have a special project that they're working on. So you mentioned the robot, but the special project could also just be like, I'm looking to get a new table for my section because we're out of places to draw and write on, or right? we're out of beds, so I want to get more beds. It can be something yeah, as simple water as Water purifier. Yeah. Yeah. The replacement is the next playbook. This is a person who is new to the section. They've replaced someone else. Could Whether have that been person lost. Yes died on the front or was relocated that's really up to you but you're new to the section so you kind of have a bit of an edge of i want to prove myself being new to the section also in would automatically include a history to the group just by yes. their introduction exactly. now it means there used to be someone else for for whatever reason mm -hmm. uh, and and you're already building those those social connections yeah exactly um then we have the scout so the scout is we kind of wrote this as like a lone wolf type character. They yeah. go out and get stuff done outside of the trenches. They're really effective at surviving outside. And, um, you know, they look out for everyone else because they have the most lethal skills on the team. Yeah. And they've, they've seen no man's land. They've been out there and back like mm -hmm. Francis Pegamagabo or Henry Norwest. Yes. And then finally we have the scarred. So the scarred is someone who has either been on the front for a long time Maybe they fought in another war that the Canadians have fought in um, or something from their past. They keep with them. Um, they they can't really let go. And they are really effective at relieving stress and things like that from the rest of the party. Yeah. Yeah. So those yeah. are the six playbooks. The six playbooks, each with, you know, their their own unique narrative. Like, mm -hmm. you know, our sergeant, for for me, it was very much based on one of the most like famous Japanese soldiers, mm -hmm. um, Masumi Mitsui, who... Uh, basically was brought over, volunteered to fight. Japanese people were seen as like second, second class citizens. And they were like, you could be in charge of the Japanese people because they don't speak English. And he led them to like major victories. And then, you know, was the subject of heavy prejudice during the second world war because everything changed for the Japanese yeah. people after world war one. Um, the replacement, like we joke that it's like based on your great grandfather. If you know, cause he, he enlisted. Yeah. It's crossing the Atlantic. And by the time he arrived, the peace treaty was signed. The war was over and he got a free vacation to France, <laughs> war torn France, yeah. but a free vacation. But what if it, what if he had arrived early and was like, Oh my God, I'm here. Yeah. Um, there was another designer based in Ottawa named Todd Craver. He's kind of known for, um, high plane samurai, which won an any actually. And, uh, he played, a, a cowardly character in our previous build. We only had three playbooks, the sergeant, the corporal and the private. And he played the private and he just didn't want to fight. And everybody else wanted to. And he just hid in a crater the whole time. And the sergeant was like, we got to go. And he's constantly at odds with them. And that's interesting. You mentioned changing the playbooks around. The original playbooks were rank. rank. And mm -hmm. these ones are very much like, yes, you have the sergeant because you've got like your commander in the group. But you have the rest are, are more their archetypes. Yeah, they're archetypes. Yeah. And they're that, that each was, uh, telling a story. That was yeah. one of the big changes we made following Metatopia was like, you know, the game runs well but it will run even better if there's more narrative and in, like instilled into it. So like you said, the replacement yeah. is very much there to automatically make sure that the group has some background yeah. because in order for somebody to play the replacement, the rest of the group has to have buy-in. It's like Monster Hearts. If you play the Chosen, yeah. there's a big bad now, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not a guarantee if you're playing the other playbooks. Uh, and, and certain playbooks in different PBTA games have a way like, like the replacement, but you know, different ones here they're going to introduce other play styles but they're also going to by their inclusion just require certain things to be added into the story if you yeah. don't have a sergeant playbook then what's the leadership for yeah, maybe this table going to be like is well, it an npc or are we leaderless we talked about in one session we did for a podcast i forget which one was it character creation cast yeah there was no sergeant, but there was a replacement. And the replacement was like, well, the last person who, one of the replacement has a question, who are you replacing? Yeah. They were like, well, the last person, and why? And they were like, well, the last person got promoted. So I guess I'm the new sergeant. So yeah. the replacement became the sergeant. The, the, the replacement doesn't necessarily just have to be someone who's green behind the ears. Who's exactly. a complete rookie showing up on their first day, but is just coming from another yeah. group yep. and has been just reassigned and now they're in charge of you. Yeah, or you could be the rookie. Yeah. Or you could be like, you know, a high ranking officer, but who's never seen combat. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's how you could still be green. Yeah. Or were you, were you reassigned to this group yeah. out of a almost punishment? 
Exactly. Right. That's mm-hmm. what ended up. Yeah. That's what ended up happening. That group was. We made the most suboptimal characters. Yeah, we don't have. We don't have time or the resources to imprison or execute you. So we're just going to send you to these trench runners, and you're going to die, and you're going to die anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what? What playbooks were we thinking? Do you want to just roll the dice? Ooh. Oh, yeah. So it's this Powered by the Apocalypse, so two D6s. Yeah. Uh, we could roll the dice, one to six. One to yeah. six. We have a there nice even playbooks. number there. Yeah. Oh, the sweet sound of dice. Uh, so yeah. many get dice. That, get that dice ASMR. I always ha- I had this idea of doing like a D&D ASMR podcast, and we just, and we just <laughs> talk <laughs> like this the entire time. And then just bring the dice right up. Uh. <laughs> or just have a mic next to a dice. Right? You, just, <laughs> you just roll it. That's why I like playing on the wooden table. I wouldn't do this on most radio station shows. But yeah, you really want. I like really the want, sound. Really want that? Yeah, you really want that. <laughs> actually, yeah. I noticed you have glass beads there. Yeah, could you actually tokens. grab uh, three of those? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, oh. I keep tokens around. When we were doing Star Trek Adventures, we needed stuff for momentum and threat. Yeah, so I've got glass beads. I've also got red tokens. Sweet. So that's perfect. Yeah, we're gonna need some of those. All right, I'll get some glass uh, beads. So out. yeah, why don't we? We could roll playbooks randomly. Yeah, I, I, I like mean, that idea. It's fun. I like that. Yeah, because part do you of me is like, first? I immediately am, like, I like the sergeant, but I like I don't want to be in charge. But also, <laughs> that might be a good story of being someone who doesn't want to be in charge. But like, <laughs> I like that. But you get yeah. a lot of stories of officers who are coming into being officers because of nepotism, privilege, and yeah. nepotism, and and family connections, and uh, not f- for any co- reasons of competence, right? Yep. But and um, or on paper, it seems like, oh, it'd be great to be in charge of all of these people. And then you go and you're like, I don't want to oh, be in charge I don't anymore. Want, I don't want any of this. Or I'm not have... in charge enough. Ooh. I don't want to be on the front. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'll give you, give, I'll hand out some of these Forbidden Land dice. Cool. They look nice. Somebody really likes Free League. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. I might have gone over to the local store and just been like, give me all of your finest dice, dice seller. You can't handle my dice. Oh, you do you need dice, Dan? I don't need dice, don't need no. Dice. Only two D6s, right? Only mm-hmm. two D6s, yeah. yeah. And then we got so, that. Alex, did you want to roll your D6 to uh, see what you're yeah. going to get? So we're going to go, I guess we're going to go in order the way they are here. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah whatever they show up One there. is guard, six is sergeant, and everything Let's in between. roll <laughs> it now. Six. Six. So you have the sergeant. You're the sergeant. Nice. You're in charge. All uh, right. Oh, no, I also rolled a six. So I'm going to roll again. We could both be sergeant. I rolled a two. <laughs> a two. So you get the scout. I get the scout. Okay. Ooh. And then my roll, I got a five. So I'm the creative. And that's the one you wanted. Yeah, well, that's the one I always play. Yeah, so. that's your favorite one. <laughs> All right. The scout is interesting. It's like the closest where this description has got this reputation of heroism of this like oh man this, war hero. this person goes out there and they come back every time and it's terrifying well i had a guy when we made characters for character creation cast i made a scout and there's a big lie surrounding him everybody thinks he's this killer but he's never killed anybody but he keeps all these ticks on his rifle and all the ticks are for every time he goes out into no man's land without incident and comes back. And everybody thinks, oh, my God, every time he goes out, he kills someone. <laughs> That's his kill count. It's his kill count, but it's, it's not, not. He's just keeping track of the days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing bad happened. Scratch another one. Everyone's like, whoa, what a it's badass. Just like, he's just a bird. He's just counting at birds. Oh, yeah. Oh, another cardinal. He just runs off to like. I don't know if they have cardinals in France. I believe they do. Yeah. Maybe not. Don't don't hate on me. Not a lot of songbirds bird left near the Western Front. But no, <laughs> not a lot of birds in general. <laughs> the artillery fire tend to uh, chase them away a while. So, ago. so when you're looking at your, so if you're, you know, uh, on the Kickstarter and you're following along and you've maybe found our quick start guide, um, you start with the left hand side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the left, you'll see um, your name, your player name, your uniform, and your appearance. Those are kind of the first things we want to take care of. Our game's going to be set in 1917. Okay. So three years into the war, Canada's been on the front for two years. Uh, it's going to be, you know what? Late September. Oh, just like the time we're playing this game. Just like and, the time and, we're playing this game. Yeah, so the leaves are starting to change if there's any leaves left on the trees. And um, the uh, what we were talking about last week in terms of the technological shifts as well, that late into the war now, it's it's not all cavalry. We're, we're <laughs> no, in the midst yes. of the Battle of Passchendaele. Yeah. Oh, man. 
Yeah, and there's the hor- not as many horses being ridden around the battlefield as there used to be three no. years ago. Certainly not not during not, our game because no. it not will with be mustard gas going everywhere. Yeah. Very rainy as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you want to give yourself a name. Now, one thing with Ross Ruffles is like be who you want to be. Right? When we were when we were designing the game, we were like, look, uh, there are times when we had to stick to history when we're writing the history of the Ross Rifle, the battles, the outcomes of the battles. But when it comes to characters, there were so many people fighting for Canada at the time. And, you know, that fighting force was really, you know, as diverse as Canada was. And so be who you want to be. You don't have to be a, a man either in this game. Uh, a lot of people are like, do I have to be a man? I'm like, no. This is where you get to take liberties because you're creating your own story. This is your alternate history within the historical timeline of the First World War. I'm trying mm-hmm. to think. The only family member I have that was even in Canada at that time was like my great great grandfather and he was a butcher for schneiders so i don't think he served in the way he was older um so maybe yeah be who be who you want to be um, so maybe, when you th- maybe i'll be him because he was a butcher and then he just had to enlist to say yeah i actually don't yeah. know my family's connection to world war one uh my half my family it's ireland and world war two i know my granddad was uh part of the national guard and played a lot of sports and uh it was a neutral country and he just (laughs) stayed in dublin um and the other side my mom's dad is uh he has cerebral palsy so he didn't serve but during that time when everyone else was out uh he ran a construction rental company and you hear stories of how a lot of women got work uh while the men were serving during world war ii Mm -hmm. But also men with disabilities got a lot of work while men mm. were serving during World War II. Oh, that's a good point. Because they stayed behind and he might not have been able to drive construction equipment, but he could certainly be a manager for a rental company in a situation where he otherwise never would have been allowed to because he was nonverbal. Uh, his cerebral palsy was such that his speech was so slurred, he was functionally nonverbal uh, when it came to communicating to people outside the family. And one of the things you can do is actually for the government yeah. of Canada has, you can search the personnel records of the First World War. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So let's... Uh, Let's search. Would it be Ecock? It would be Rice. If How it was do you spell in Canada. that? Ecocks didn't come to Canada until me. I was the first. Oh. So, so Rice is in like Rice? R-I-C-E. Okay. I don't even know if that's how they spelt it 100 years ago, though, because I understand it to be um, German-Scottish, so it might have been a case like There were Kingston. lots of Rices. In there fact, are there lots. are 26 pages of oh, Rices. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a Rice Avenue in Hamilton that I understand to be named after my great-grandfather because of his connection to the Shadow. There's Medical an Hospital. Albert James Rice and... Albert Lorenzo Rice and Albert Lewis Rice. <laughs> lots, lots of Albert. 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 There's actually three Al, Alberts. Al Albert Rice. Oscar Rice. Al Rice. Sure. And what's really, oh, Albert Lew, Lewis Rice was a captain. And if you actually click on like the actual person's name, you could find their attestation papers. You can find their original yeah. documents. You can download that's it all too. Cool. You, you can see what they did before. Down to like dental records. It's yeah. Wow. It's, it's very, very detailed. So like this uh, captain... Albert Lewis Rice was a salesman, an unmarried salesman before the war. Huh. Interesting. And was willing to be vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at that. It's how progressive. Uh, it did it, not belong to any active militia. Anything, if you're ever in uh, near downtown Hamilton, down by the waterfront, you'll see a lot of houses that have a small door just to the right of the main entrance door and a little, it almost looks like like a, a half of a garage that's kind of built into the side yeah. of all these houses. After World War I, when all of the soldiers came back to Canada and started looking for work, there was a government program where if you added the little mini houses to the side of your house, the government would subsidize you. And so there's all of these houses around that part of Hamilton because of the steel mills where single men were looking for work when they came back and they could lodge in these little mini one bedroom bachelor apartments that were built onto the side of all of these houses. And and they're still kind of there. Some of them have been renovated into mud rooms. Others are rented on Airbnb. But they're still kind of there. It's this interesting. I haven't seen them in Toronto because Toronto had a big construction boom in the 60s. So a lot of that stuff would have been wiped out. Whereas in Hamilton, some of these buildings still remain. The century old homes still have these little like it's not a garage. It's it's a little bit smaller than that. It's just it's literally just a bedroom built onto the side of the house. Like a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. If you're interested in like World War One monuments in Toronto, like the Soldiers Tower at University of Toronto, we went there 
earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. So you just go check it out. They have, the, there's like an actual clock tower with a World War One memorial at the top. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So anyway, on the left hand side, this. you got your name, your player name, your appearance, your uniform. Uh, and so your equipment. So there's no weapon damage in Ross rifles. Yes. The equipment has no mechanical effect. Yeah. Uh, so everybody kind of comes with a, a weapon, like a starting weapon for flavor. I have a Ross rifle. Uh, yes. So the the I mean, in, when we when we talk about the Ross rifle in Canadian history class, you're like, oh, it's legendary for being like the shittiest gun of the war. Uh, well, one of the things we like the raw we used Ross rifle A as a, as a symbol for Canadian perseverance, mm-hmm. and B we like alliteration. <laughs> we do like alliteration. We do like alliteration. <laughs> a lot of our stuff has alliteration in it. But uh, the Ross rifle was interesting because it was one of the best sharpshooting guns of the war. It was just over-engineered and was not suited to being used in a trench. Yeah, mud was not a good combo with the Ross Yeah, nor was like surplus ammunition. And like Francis Pegamagabo, who was like the deadliest soldier, used a Ross rifle. He killed like 378 people and captured like hundreds more. Wow. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm actually learning about him for the first time today while we're talking. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be reading up on this yeah later. read, read up there's on a this lot dude. of historical ignorance i'm bringing to this table i'll have you know <laughs> that yeah, it would, yeah. I mean, it's not ignorance it's just this is this is omitted history in yeah. our in our school system ignorance is the wrong word but uh, uh just a lack of understanding yeah uh, and yeah. uh and uh, not being aware that um, and that's what that's yeah. what we're trying to do with this project yeah. so you got your equipment then you've got your tools other so these are all things that you would have had and then you have a personal item uh, a personal item is something that is not standard issue. People have done like, you know, like naughty postcards or <laughs> the classic Bibles and then, you know, hoping that it'll catch a bullet or a pocket watch, a locket, um, a paintbrush. Yep. Hmm. Musical instrument. And these have a mechanical effect on the game because it can be used to help with psychological damage. Okay. So well, whatever. Some One person I, I remember at a con did... Uh, they're like, I have bacon. And yeah. I just carried bacon. And, and, but they were like, they were like, but I have this problem. The rats keep trying to get into my bed. <laughs> and the whole of my group was like, I wonder why. <laughs> it's the bacon. Oh, and you can circle your uniform type, appearance. Mm-hmm. Let's go with stained. And appearance. <laughs> Doughy. <laughs> Let's pick Doughy. Yeah, we tried. To, we found like, we thought a Doughy would be the best, like uh, period period word, a period word. We we tried to like stout would work. Oh, stout's stout a good one. Good we too. should add stout. I don't know what my personal item is going to be. You, you got the creative. Yes. What kind of art? What, what well, kind of creative? I'm going to be you? a journalist who's been assigned to the front line. What, what if it's what if it's like a really ornate clipboard? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking a typewriter, but how? Like, it's pretty hard to lug around a typewriter. Right? Yeah, maybe you're carrying this typewriter around and it's just getting so banged up and keys are missing. <laughs> I'm missing the L key, so I can never report that we've lost. <laughs> we've only lost. I have thought, because since I'm playing as Al Rice, it uh, got me thinking also about my grandfather who has cerebral palsy who ran things. He actually, I think I've got it in here. He's got a poetry book called Rice to the Occasion. Uh, he <laughs> actually did write it. And I'm thinking this is this is a character who leaves and is alone at times. This is a, a, a it's almost a diary or it's a book. Ooh, it's a book of poetry, cool. and it's his. I'm just changing it to a little earlier. It's his rice to the occasion. I like that. And That's it's cool. His, and it's this book, and it's kind of kind of takes you also to the, like Flanders Fields and some of these others. Like yeah. the, there was lots of writing that happened uh, in, in in this era, and it's it's it is very hard to transport yourself into the shoes of these people that served in world war one mm-hmm. because entertainment and communication and technology like there's no radio not until the 20s there's no real forms of mass communication other than the newspaper and mm-hmm. so writing and the written word and letters and all of that it's it's very different from even what it would be to the world war ii yeah. and oh, to totally. the next generation of of war that would happen is it's it's such a you know trying to think of like, what were these people before they came into the war? What kind of jobs would they have had? I mean, the job I've got working at a radio station or working in Wouldn't entertainment, exist. those jobs don't exist. There's no television, there maybe theater, but even then, like, is that a job that people like, like, uh, it's certainly not common enough to, it would mostly be Dude, circus. 
Well, but circuits, but it, it would mostly be either you work urban or you work rural. And if you worked yeah. urban, you worked sales. And it was, it was those, that was kind of it. Yeah. I, I'd be selling typewriters or something. Yeah. In, in right after World War I, the first batteryless radio in Canada was Roger's first battery radio, which is what CFRB stands for, Canada's first Roger's battery list. Mm. And the very first radio station and the very first radio was an advertisement for a radio. Hmm. And that's what CFRB <laughs> was when it was first oh, no created. And it was it was Canada's first Roger's battery list. And it was a radio station on the 1010 dial on AM to broadcast an advertisement for this new batteryless radio invention. Oh, that's good. I didn't know that. That's, that's cool. Funny. So you go to a store, they'd have but, the radio on. But this is 1917. Yeah. That won't exist for another four years. Maybe you have a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be the creative. Maybe maybe you're trying uh, to work well, out our... Well, uh, telephones were around, so you could have been working tele- yeah. telecom. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, yeah. there's, there's telephones. There's, there's telephones. Yeah. There's telegrams. Um, yeah. You know, there's that. But even then, it's not reliable. It's not wireless. And it's not like we don't have... We don't have that kind of communication. Like if you've got a telephone, it's because someone's also rolled a cable yeah. out from a building. <laughs> so good luck. I guess you could be <laughs> out like, yeah, it's true. You could be doing candy grams or something. Like if you want to keep it into the marketing industry. That commander of the Devil's Brigade I mentioned. Yeah. Um, he was I- I- an indigenous Canadian. He had darker skin. And when they were in Italy, and this is World War II, they were sent to restore um, a telegram line that had been broken. Uh, there was a line of communication that had been severed. It's out in the middle of a field. It's the middle of nighttime. When they went out there, the German army was reinforcing. And it was as far as the, I could see troops marching down the main road. Oh, my God. And they're like, shit. And so the guy used the fact that he had darker skin, went into a farmhouse, dressed himself up as an Italian farmer, went out into the fields in the middle of the night, and they just looked and went, oh, it's just some... Just some farmer. Just some farmer working the field at nighttime because it's safer. And using the hoe in his hand, put the line back together. Oh. oh. Right in front of them and then went back <laughs> and oh. went off and he got a medal for it. Dang. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Use your gifts. Uh, I decided to roll my name by using a yeah. name generator. Yeah, you did. <laughs> What'd you get? Uh, Benjamin Williams. So Nice. Benny Willis. Because Benny to, to be Willis. honest, the only relative I had that would have been of age to serve, I don't even know his name. Mm. Just do you find, grandpa. <laughs> do you find a lot of people who play this try to connect to a real world counterpart in their family? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. That's like a, that's a lot a of people are like, go-to. oh, like I've seen some people like text their parents. Because like, you yeah. had that page yeah. bookmarked because this must have happened so often now that you've got this Canada page. Oh, yeah. For the record. Yeah. And that's one of the first things we found when we were starting to do research was like, oh, you can go on to the personnel records and find so many soldiers. Yeah. Find everyone. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. Find literally everyone. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think Alex and I are not original thinkers. So <laughs> no, you're, you're original thinkers. I, I think differently, not necessarily originally. Yeah. So are, are you guys down the left side of your page? I am. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. So the middle side, you got your attributes, your questions and your bonds. We always leave the bonds to the end so that we can, you know, do our introductions. Then yeah, figure get out to introduce way. our characters and yeah. then form our bounds, just like what we did when we we're playing Root. Yeah. And so we have four attributes. We have valor, which is like your bravery, your charisma, uh, I, which is your your observation skills, your skills with firearms. Uh, wit is your quick thinking uh, and your tactical acumen. And then, of course, brawn is your physical strength. It does. I know that's not the graphic, but it does, with that little line coming out, it does look like it's flipping me the bird. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does. There. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe it is. I am. So, uh, valor, so you're going to assign wit and brawn. Yeah, so you're going to assign the those at the those values in that order, um, and then you get to add one to any of them to a maximum. So of what's three. the difference between I and wit? So I is your observational skill, mm-hmm. and wit is your quick thinking. If you actually look at the move sheets that mm-hmm. you have, oh, I see. Next to every single move is the icon for that attribute, and you have your playbook moves on the other side of your yeah, playbook so, as well. So yeah, yeah pick up basically slot them in wherever you want, or. Yeah, uh, so you have your numbers listed yeah. in in that order. Those are the the order in which they go into these boxes. Oh, okay, and, and then, then you, just you get pick that one, one of them. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm going to give the two then to I um, mm-hmm. for the scout because I'm looking at you want to be a moves. sniper. Yeah, well, you got like out of the night and scan the horizon, pull and the trigger, things like that. Yeah. Whereas brawn, 
I'm going to give that the minus two because I actually wrote down an ill-fitting uniform and a thin appearance. Um, Uh, There might mm -hmm. be a bit of helping others through sacrificing his own self-care. And I'm not eating well. I'm not looking after myself. And I keep pushing myself. Maybe you're just sitting there watching. And I keep putting myself out and keep volunteering, keep going out. And there's almost like, is this self-destructive or is this heroic? And is there a difference? So that's just kind of where my head was going. Uh, Valor and wit. I think I'm going to give wit to two. And the valor is only going to get one. Nice. Uh, Oh, wait. No, one of them should be a zero. One, two, three, four. Yeah, sorry. So I've got a two. You got to switch your, your wit two. or your... your. I okay, think. so okay, so my wit is going to be one and my valor is going to be zero. Yeah, That's there what you it's go. Gonna be. And then you have questions. Everybody has three questions. For instance, the scar is like, why haven't you been promoted? Well, there's three of us. So why don't we do one question at a time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All uh, right. So, uh, Pat, you've got your first question. My first question is, how long have I been stationed on the Western Front? I'm going to say my answer is four months. Um, but I haven't really seen combat until now. I've just been behind the scenes. I'm a war reporter, so I've been sent to report on, um, sorry, you know, the the upper workings of management command. And now I've finally decided a better story would be real people up at the front. So can you please reassign me to the front lines? And I've just been moved up there. So that's really cool. So uh, a wartime correspondent. Yeah. Uh, before and- the term has been coined, like. Like there, there have always been reporters and people who have told stories from the front lines going back to 1812. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, here we are. This is also a time of communication changes with telephone and uh, telegram and w- information coming back home faster than ever. Yeah. Uh, and in the First World War, there was also a tradition of like playing war movies at the local theater. Yeah. Yep. Right? There, was, so. there was a whole article I read on the people that were reporting during the moment of armistice and like the people who are trying to get the news first because at that by the end it was the worst kept secret that this thing was going to get signed but no one knew exactly when it was going to happen and Mm -hmm. there were a lot of false reports of it's peace and people having celebrations in the streets and then the oh no actually no we're still fighting still still negotiating still going on and and there was this real uh I, i know in my journalism courses it was this whole about like get it first but first get it right uh, mm-hmm. was was the line that that uh, our, our professor kept teaching us because there was this especially at the in in a year from now at the end of World War one a lot of these reporters the pressure from their own editors to get the news sent to them but because of time delays of getting it to print and sending it out you would want to send them like seven hours notice before the news was going to happen so they could get the extra extra in the newspaper yeah. out on the street the minute it happened but if they were wrong and they were off by a day, Right. Like it wasn't as instantaneous as it would be even 10 years later. Oh, yeah, for sure. So anyways, this whole. OK, so that's your, interesting. That's sorry, your question. Going off on a whole thing. That's your yeah. question. Uh, Justin, what's your first question? Uh, you've taken many lives for king and country. What toll has this taken on you? Uh, and it's interesting. I've already circled thin and ill fitting. And I was talking about this. Like I've taken many lives. I'm out there. I'm just not eating. Right. I'm I'm physically thin. Do you think, are you punishing yourself? Yeah, I mean, this is not a time where like PTSD is not understood or talked about. It's just shell shock. Yeah. And it's this sense of maybe like atonement or or self-punishment or or just, just not looking out for myself and not putting that kind of understanding of caring for myself first. Like you can't look after others unless you look after yourself. And I'm not looking after myself. Right. I'm putting myself out further and further and further. And I'm also getting further and further from my own health as I do this. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm real looking. You're haggard looking. Quite emaciated. Yeah. yeah. Like a ghost. <laughs> okay. All Alex, right. What do you have? So my question is, how long have you been stationed in the Western Front? I put down about a year and a half. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've moved up to the rank of sergeant because uh, my trade was, I was a butcher. So... Cutting things and seeing things in different states of, of distress it wasn't as shocking to me going into the war. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. you, you know, I, I, you know, regularly had to work in, you work in a slaughterhouse, you work in different places that wouldn't necessarily, the regular average Joe wouldn't have necessarily been through. So it's kind of like standing in front of a crowd, if you imagine them all being naked, you're not like, as long as you just don't think of them as humans. 
if, if, if basically that how I've had yeah, to come there's something twisted it is, about that. That's I've, I've gone okay. It's just another day, you know, it's as just, a butcher, or as, yeah. uh, you know, working. Yeah. I've had to work that into my head. So it's it's sort of I've not numbed myself. It's just it's just another day. It's another know, day at the job. Another yeah. day at the job, and um, I didn't mention it, but my uh, personal item is a wheel of cheese. Well, this is from tr- from, from you know back home. Nineteen seventeen, well seasoned. You yeah. know, <laughs> er, er, early nineteen hundreds Toronto. It, it was old abattoirs, right? It was Hogtown, mm-hmm. and yeah. this was like the the place where all the meat in the country got processed. And uh, certainly, if we, if you wanted to just be even Toronto based, sure, like that. that was that was a, a major employer in Toronto was was working in in food processing. So I, I guess I was my skill set what made me well suited for confronting the horrors of work. your constitution was yes. strong yeah like yeah. I, I wasn't going to you know be sick from seeing what was happening necessarily in the battlefield which i think makes me feel sick of you because like these are still people y- yeah right? and I, it's like i, I know they're, they're people, not but just pigs. i know i know they're people but it's like it's, cutting's cutting <laughs> yeah oh, at least i do that's, at least i do I, my it's, work it's from it's a interesting distance. to see how like your two characters have kind of handled the horrors of the war so far mm-hmm. like you're just like you're just so good at this one thing, but you hate that you're good at it. And you but maybe hate yourself for But if I don't keep doing it. this, it's also keeping me alive. Yeah, and then everybody else will die around you. And you're just like, you know what? Just I, another day at the office. Just another day at the office. Maybe they call you the butcher of yeep. And well, because it keeps, I, I can keep my head calm and cool to make those tactical decisions because I don't get emotionally invested in it. Yeah, and so maybe you're just distant from everyone too. So yeah. you have a hard time socializing with everyone because you've just so firmly compartmentalized your Where war experience. Somebody else might be freaking out. I'll just I'll tell them, you know, shut up and just move on. You yeah. pick up pick up the, the the piece of viscera and yeah, move it's it. Like you can cry when you're home. Yeah. Ooh, I like this. Yeah. What's your second question, Patrick? So my second question is, how do I express myself artistically? And I'm thinking that I'm writing a novel about this situation. Um, just as a side project, because obviously I'm a war journalist, I'm reporting on the front lines, but I'm thinking that, you know, in order to really grapple with what's happening here at the front, I'm almost like J.R.R. Tolkien it up. I'm writing a novel, but about not about your dead friends. No, about what's happening around me, about the soldiers around, because I feel like these are the stories that aren't going to get told in the future from I know journalism as a journalist. Right. Right. And so. But the journalism reports they are, have to be factual. Yes. They're credible. They're 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 um, cred checked. They uh, you know verified reports. But they also has to remove any of your personal observations exactly. and biases. And that yeah. whereas this, is your this novel thing, is what I'm. It really, doesn't have to be any of those yeah. things. It can just be all of the feeling and all of the everything you can't put into your reports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. What's your second question? My second question is your rifle has been with you since you enlisted. How have you made it your own? And kind of following up from that last question, if I'm not looking after myself, I think the one thing I am always looking after is my rifle. And so if if my clothes are ill-fitting and my body is haggard and emaciated, this gun, though, is clean and polished and is it looks like it's a day old. And it's the it, 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 I'm not caring for anything else in my life, except for this one thing that I have a love hate relationship mm-hmm. with. Nice. So it's like, it's the opposite of you. Mm-hmm. It, it's well kept. Nice. Uh, for my second question, I have, how long have you been in charge of this section? Uh, I put six months enough. I, you know, I, I moved up the rank pretty fast. I've been here enough that I know everybody. Oh, command must love you. You're yeah. ruthless. Yeah. Yeah. You just not, I, I, I'm not completely cold. Like I, I, I am a feeling person, but at the same time, uh, I was not afraid to, you know, it, it's like, oh, whatever I was told to do, I did. No questions asked and accomplished it to the point where I moved up fairly quickly. They like that about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. A, they, oh, go, you know, take that trench. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. W- uh, when do you want it done? That, that, that sort of, that was the mentality and. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Third one, Patrick. So my third question, as the creative, I get to describe the section's dugout. Um, so the question mm. is, how have I made the section's dugout unique? Well, first, I'm going to say, as assigned this this job as a war journalist, Command has given me a typewriter. They've given me a bunch of, like, a desk to work at. So our dugout is a bit, you know, more well-equipped than other people. We might have 
enough beds for all of us instead of having to share a bed. Um, nice. Well, they, the, the, the news that it's getting back to Canada is yes. coming from your dugout. So, so your yeah, dugout important. is going to have a little bit more privilege than the other. Yeah, dugout. Do you think well, it's more it's, reinforced? I've even written here that it's actually a former officer's quarters that has been Ooh. re- uh, tooled to for our section. So, like, you know, you've got one of the best. It's you shored the, up with wood on the side. Yeah. It's not just it's, mud it's walls. It's deeper down there, so you don't feel the shock. You barely feel of, the rumbling. Do we have, yeah. have electrical lighting? Yes. Yeah. So you've got one of the best killers. You've got like a hardened leader, and you've got somebody who the home front is relying on to bring yeah, news. They're they're in a way manipulating you into their propaganda. To and then that's why you're writing, though. Yeah. I think you're aware of the fact that they're manipulating you, right? Yes. So that's why you're writing your own. Your, yeah, well, because I have to grapple your with your war that. story. It, yeah. Even even here at the front, they're still trying to give you a polished image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of, it's not that bad. Look at how much oh, we're looking after our boys. Great. Look at our dugout. Yeah. Our dugout is wonderful. Every single dugout is like this. We look after the best for our soldiers as they serve for king and country. And yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How, how what's your final one? Mine is your time conducting reconnaissance has keen, made you keenly aware of the dangers no man's land has to offer. Establish one truth. About the dangers of no man's land. Yeah, one one thing. And I, I was looking. I was like, oh, I don't, uh, I don't have an immediate like gut reaction to that. Um, it could be like a uh, like an unexploded mustard gas shell, which would there be was terrifying. This, there was <laughs> this feeling that what if one of the reasons why I'm so good at going out into the open is I'm kind of claustrophobic. And staying in the dugout is really uncomfortable. And Mm. so there's this bit of as horrifying and dangerous as No Man's Land is, it's also outside. And there's the open air, even if it's what that is. And there might be like, I know it wants me a truth about the dangers of No Man's Land. So maybe there's no cover. But yeah, that might be it. There's no cover. But that's in your section. in, in, in In a way for the scout is also kind of a comfort. Yeah. In And again, this like, living this paradox maybe there's like maybe you like there are craters from all the ex- artillery maybe you enjoy being in a crater more than you enjoy being in a dugout because at least you can see the sky from a mm-hmm. crater because watch the clouds a little all quiet in the western front looking for birds sort of thing you just yeah. lie on the in the crater and look at the clouds roll by and for just a moment it's just and know, nobody can see you when you're in that crater maybe you enjoy your time scouting there's an isolation to it that's yeah quiet oh i like that What's your now, final question? I actually have two. Yeah. Four. So I'm going to, I can combine them sort of. So the questions are, how do you handle the burden of command and how did you earn your promotion? I'm going to sort of combine them into one answer here. Uh, how did I earn my promotion first, which is uh, I, my job at the beginning of the war because of my, because of how I could handle myself, uh, my job was to collect the dead. Ooh. The, where you have to go out, collect the you know mm-hmm. dog tags, collect the weapons, collect the ammunition, finish people off if they're still on the ground. Yeah, uh, you know, ban at them if they have to, whether it be friend or foe, to finish them off, and then collect the dead for off the battlefield. And so I was moved up quickly because I was able Just to like taking out a cow. I was able, to, yes, I was able to handle that Just job. Right, base so yeah. skull. So how I handle the burden is. You're very stoic. I, I appear like nothing affects me. Have a bit of a hint of the macabre in, in the joke. Yeah, you're making me sick to my stomach. I know. As you described this. So, for for instance, I how I handle it is through maybe a little bit of humor or what I would perceive to be humor. Gallows humor. Yes. Mm-hmm. For, for instance, I'll, I'll say, all right, uh, it's time to go make some sausages, things like that. Uh, say things to people. You know, it's, it's time. Turn them to mincemeat. Uh, but... How I actually handle it. This is why I'm not eating, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I appear, you know, to be cold, I'm feeling and all that, but in reality, I, I get night terrors, Ooh. and I secretly drink to to not show the rest of the of people under my command that that's how I'm handling. Yeah, it. You, when you when you make it back to Toronto and you make it back to that abattoir, all yeah. those pigs are going to have human faces. <laughs> like, yeah, then you're just, you're going to oh, be yeah. you're going to go so back gonna, and be, never work as a butcher. You're not going to be able to you know, kill animals I'm, I'm, anymore. I'm seen as like the stone wall. But the reality is, when everybody else is asleep, yeah. I'm having a couple drinks. Otherwise, I can't well, sleep. And you've been promoted to our, our 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 section head, and like command loves you because this is exactly the kind of behavior they need from people that are serving out here. Is mm-hmm. especially at this you know, point in the war, it, it, like they're they're they've been, they've already dealt with so many stories of soldiers 
playing soccer on Christmas and, you know, trying to reach out and sending notes to the other side and, and getting to meet them and shaking hands. And no, 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 no. This is the enemy. They cannot be humanized in any way. And here we have yeah, I, you know, like the poster of these, what these we're are looking sacks for. of meat. Chop up the sacks of meat. And they, they sent a journalist to make sure that you're writing the right things about this yeah. hardened war hero. Yeah. 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 So he's not going to say, he's not going to show that I'm drinking and that I'm, I'm making jokes about the enemy or, or the debt. You're just going to say, oh, he's valiant and mm-hmm. and leading these troops to victory and, and blah, blah, blah. When the reality is, uh, after the war, I'm going to be a mess. Does command know that you drink? No. No? Okay. And, but and, because of our posh setup, we have access, yeah, to, access to copious drinks. amounts yeah. of alcohol. Stuff that, would, that the average wouldn't get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have all of our questions. Now... On the right-hand side of your sheet, you have uh, four things to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Ground, experience, harm, and stress. So ground represents your narrative momentum towards your objective. So if you are in open combat, if the enemy is firing on you and you've gone over the top, this is for going over the top, and you say, we need to take out that machine gun nest, and the GM says, okay, well, we need to get three ground at least Half of your group, so at least two of you, mm-hmm. need to get at least three ground. Um, and that could be gained through like charging, rolling bog down, any any number of, of moves. Experience is, uh, you know, is your classic RPG mm-hmm. experience. You gain experience points by completing objectives, but also by resolving your bonds, which we will get to the mm-hmm. end. If anything, uh, your bonds are underneath your questions. Mm-hmm. And if your bonds change, they're, they're going to be resolved and new things will emerge. Uh, when you have four experience points, you get to advance and level up. When you advance, you can either increase an attribute by one or get a new playbook move. There's harm and stress. So harm is your physical damage, right? You can take four, check off the boxes. You get all four checked off, you die. Uh, stress represents psychological damage, that war neurosis, that shell shock. And uh, Patrick and I did a lot of, and, and Daniel, we did a lot of research yeah. on how we can respectfully incorporate shell shock into the game. Um, do you want to talk about Moss Park? Yeah, well, so we went to uh, play test an earlier build of the game. I think it was an earlier build. Right? It was an earlier build. Yeah, at the Moss Park Armory in Toronto with a bunch of medical officers. Yeah. Um, and they love the game and they gave us a lot of good advice on how to accurately represent um, how psychological damage affects the soldier and how to accurate military narratives as, as well. Right? Yeah. Well, one of them, he he did like two tours of Afghanistan. Yeah. He was in one of our breakout Daniels. He was in Daniel's breakout con group and didn't tell Daniel he was a vet. Oh. And still serving. And Daniel ran the game and he loved it. And he introduced himself to Daniel and was like, hey, I, you know, like. I served in the Canadian Armed Forces, and you should come play this with my unit. And we did that, and now we're we're going to get in touch with them again because one of our stretch goals for the Kickstarter is actually a, a medic playbook. So we're going to add a seventh one if we hit that stretch goal. Um, so stress in this case, uh, there are six boxes rather than four. And as you check them off, you get these increasingly poor consequences so for instance if you check off one there's no effect on you because everybody at this point is feeling this stress yeah Yeah. if you check off a second one you're gonna get minus one to an attribute a third one minus one to another attribute an attribute is that attribute determined when you check that off uh it's it's based on it's it's based based on on what's going on in the narrative yeah yeah Yeah. so depending on what's going on it might affect depending on how you got that stress will depend on what for instance uh, for you it could be you've got really good eye but maybe your vision starts to get blurred yeah and you can't shoot yeah or maybe you have a hard time pulling the trigger, like um, was it that yeah. character Charlie in uh, Wonder Woman? So my wits would be affected on, on on certain things depending on the decision that's being made yeah. at the time that you got the stress. Got it. Um, then if you get four, you get minus one to all rolls until your stress is removed. Um, then all seven to nine rolls count as minus sixes Whew, on a PBT again. On a PBT and that's brutal. And then the last one, you hit your breaking point. At, so yeah, you're removed from the narrative at that point. Yeah. yeah so at, at that fifth one, you just can't make mistakes anymore. Yeah. Because uh, it is all just going wrong. And okay. then and then uh, the breaking point. What happens at the breaking point? Is it just the characters removed from play? Yeah. There's, you, there's, yeah. there's going to be. Uh, you, you, there's a debrief. There's a talk about mm-hmm. it. Um, 
is this is when you know that shell shock mm -hmm. renders you unable to fight yeah in zombie world uh they have trauma cards and when you collect yeah. too many of that uh the characters are moved as a pc because they're no longer safe to the enclave or to themselves and depending on the context it depends on how that mm -hmm. manifests in the story but they're just no longer a, a player character um yeah interesting and uh, i mean obviously making a character is intentionally done to be very quick <laughs> so yes. that should something happen untowards to your character you can grab another playbook circle 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 number 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 Indigo. And you're good. Yeah. And here's the thing, though, like stress and harm can be removed and stress may seem brutal, but this is a mechanical way for us to make sure that the players lean on each other for help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if, if in so the narrative, they might not together to remove stress yeah, on there themselves. Are, yeah. yeah. There are some playbooks like the replacement and the creative are designed to remove, remove stress, stress. And the scarred. And there are basic moves as well. Like if you are in the trenches and you decide to engage in some sort of means of providing comfort to each other like you want to play a game of cards and it goes well you might be able to remove some stress that way stuff like that mm -hmm. um, as long as we're eating vegetarian <laughs> <laughs> mm, tasty, tasty <laughs> maybe that's all you have maybe you just have you maybe you just have carrots right um maybe meat's been hard to come by yeah Car oh not when i'm around I just get, oh that's true you're the hero they're sending you tons of uh corned beef yeah yeah um, carrots and cheese. Uh, that's the front page. On the back page, you have your playbook moves. Mm -hmm. And some of them are already checked off for you. You get those right from the get-go, but you still get to pick an additional one. So you pick your playbook move. And okay, then, so for the scout, none of mine are checked off. Because you get to yeah. pick two. I get to pick, I get, yeah, I get to pick a bonus move and I get to pick a scout move. Oh, okay, I didn't even realize. One of them ties right into my backstory. Take a swig. There you go. <laughs> Dang. Um, so between my scout moves, there's Stormtrooper, uh, take down an enemy soldiers in their own trench or out of the night when you strike from the shadows. That feels more in line with the story we've been telling with, yeah. with, mm -hmm. with Al. So I'm going to pick out of the shadows. So take a swig says when you turn, uh, sorry, when you uh, turn to alcohol to repress your memories of those you've lost, roll with valor. Uh, on a 10 plus, you temporarily distance yourself from the horrors of the war, remove stress. On a seven to nine, you temporarily numb yourself to the needs of the, of the section. Remove stress, but the section receives minus one to its next uh, strategize roll. Yeah. This works out. Remember that what we were talking about, the crater and the sky? The first yep. bonus move is the site of safety. Mm -hmm. uh, when you roll to take cover, add your eye instead of your wit. And my eye's at two and my wit's at one. Yeah. Uh, the other two are interesting, but the site of safety feels like it, it works. It works really well into that story. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, the others were... Um, it's concealed, uh, taking a bonus whenever you blend in, and last man out when you're covering the section as they retreat, you get you get some extra options there. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, we we work really hard to make sure that it, you because even if you play the scout a bunch of times, you can play a different scout totally. every single time. You can make you can make a scout that's all based on your trench club. Oh, by the way, did you do your trench club? Yeah. So my trench club. Um, I actually, because it's like, it's a unique trench club and describe it. I thought it was a, a stock from an older rifle oh, cool. um, and uh, broken off and maybe strapped to like an end of a spade or something like that to reinforce it. But it's, that's ultimately what it is. It's just this broken old rifle that um, I, I look after these things like they're pristine and maybe this one. Have you ever seen a uh, gunstock war club before? I have now. That's what you described. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is a, you know, a traditional indigenous weapons um, used by, you know, the Eastern Woodland peoples and the, the Plains tribes. Yeah. There's um, uh, the Irish have a game called hurling um, and it's kind of mm -hmm. a, like a like a field hockey st stick, but flattened out. And oh. um, and it, it was used a lot by uh, in, in the Civil War and by the IRA as like they could use it as a a, a, a makeshift like a what? training weapon when they were doing drills and stuff and then if people came around the corner it'd be like well we're just playing hurling right like oh. it's not actually so but it had the same <laughs> shape so you could hold it and do the same maneuvers right with, with it as yeah. if it was a rifle which is kind of a coincidence um but that's but, that's super interesting but yeah and uh but it, it could also be used as a club and in yeah. hurling it usually is and so uh you, sure you don't uh, want to carry around a shillelagh so you can just bop people on the head is your character irish um 
I mean, I'm Irish, but uh, if we're going with the with with uh, with the rice family uh, connection, it would uh, it would be more of a German Scottish hmm. heritage. But going back into the 1800s in in Canada, like the, the rice, as you saw, there's a lot yeah, of them. Yeah, there's a lot. They go <laughs> way back, um, and so. Uh, but there's a chance that it might have actually been something closer to vice that was anglicized right. in Canada and turned into the word rice, but was actually an older so German name. I think since we're getting yeah. into like introductions, yeah. do you think your character's German heritage um, causes conflict on the front? I think or it's- do you think you're open about that? I think it's a little bit more like my own connection of, this is just stuff that your family has told you, yeah. but it's, it, it is much more of a uh, like six generations of Canadians and they've gone through like that time when if you landed, we'd give you a land and you'd have farming place and it kind of moved from there. But it's just sort of, it was talked about in like a Scotland and Germany and Europe and, but in that kind of no real connection to it. Right. You're um, Canadian. Yeah. Through and through. Um, to and, uh, uh, and there's nothing in, in, in his name or anything to that, but it's also like, Here's an opportunity to see where you came from. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And in this case, like and, uh, the Germans aren't even like, they're not seen as evil like they were in no, World War II. No, they're II. just the other they're side. They're just the other side. Yeah. 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 So do you want to say anything more But it's very much less of a, of, a, of a connection to any kind of old world patriotism and, 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 and actually for Canada. Yeah. Is, is, is that real connection? Um, it's, I mean, it's a little more simple, but. It is what it is. Um, so, so what's your character's name? Uh, I went with Al Lewis Rice. Uh, nice. uh, from from that, uh, uh, that we pulled up from when we pulled up from the from the archive, uh, and uh, you know he got his vaccinations and he got uh, his vaccinations. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and is a sa- and was a salesman uh, before he came. He was of that urban connection uh, uh, out out of a city, um, maybe something like Hamilton or or Niagara, uh, and uh, did like import exports and and just like office stuff and then it was time to enlist and you just did what you did because that was what you did when you were that age and uh, and off you went and you signed up and you marched away and it was all you know heroes welcome as all everyone waved goodbye and you got onto the boat during training it was just an aptitude just good eyes good not not out of any sense of personal like approach to it like i wasn't pursuing this it was just oh you're good at that Here's your rifle. Off you go. Keep shooting targets. And yeah. um, they did. They call them targets. You're like these are people. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, but uh, it, during training uh, uh, at you know at the Canadian National Exhibition was a military training ground. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. It, they, they were just targets, and it was just marksmanship records and 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 doing better and higher than average. And then it was just like, all right, you're just going to go over there, and you're going to do exactly there what you've been doing here. And it's just going to be mm-hmm. more of that. And it's going to, and treating it kind of, if we're talking to the CNE, like a midway game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, just like, <laughs> you know, you know, you knock the targets off the shelf, get a prize. Maybe that's and, how it was initially. And yeah. And, and it was just, you know, kind of, there were all kinds of strategies done during World War One to train soldiers to stop thinking about what they were doing. And in a 1914, 1917 way of gamifying their thinking, right? Like, that kind of was a big part of why medals get handed out when yep. they do. And you do that is just to sort of keep reinforcing carrot and stick mentality. And so anyway, it wasn't anything that he pursued. It's just, you know, when this is over, go back, start selling again. And it's just the thing that happened for a few years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's, and that's where, and that's where, you know, he's found himself. But as you're seeing, like, there's this whole sense of like, he's not looking after himself anymore nope. and he's getting thin he's what? getting haggard. The, the uniform that was served to him, he's two sizes smaller than it, than he was wearing it when it first got on. And everything is just looking oversized. He's looking real mousy. His ears look big because his whole body has gotten smaller than mm-hmm. everything else. Right. And mm-hmm. there's that one actor you see in like every post-apocalyptic movie. He's like the mousy character. And yeah. that's kind of what Al is looking. He's, he's small, he's thin. Also in a weird way is helping him to hide and be nimble and move mm-hmm. around. And even though he's not caring for himself, it's, oh, it's actually making him better at what he's doing, which is worse because he doesn't want to be good at this stuff. But it, he is. And so he now found himself in. And now we're going to tell your story and you're going to be in the news and you're being put up with a journalist and with a commander that you're horrified of. This whole thing just sucks, but I'm really good at it. And it's keeping me alive. And, you know, I'll be home soon. Yeah. Now, that's what you're telling yourself. What did Al sell? 
beforehand. Import export. It would have just been oh, like foods and how, goods. Maybe brought in wine and uh, and exported. You know, steel and meat. Maybe there was like all that just, kind of just full on. I thought it would have been just, funny a, if just was, an entrepreneur. If yeah, he, if he well, sold hunting rifles. Yeah, it just just just. Uh, bring well, maybe you did sell any rifles, and that's how you. Uh, sure, but it was just like you, you, you demoed them. them. Like you, I was just say you did demonstrations. It was just a terminal. Uh, I, I don't think there was anything with warfare. I, no, I think no. it was more likely just uh, um, selling um, goods and services across the American border and bringing in, you know, the you know, the odd, you know, Not wine like, from Europe and and exporting uh, fruit from Ontario. Like you and, weren't a snake oil salesman selling no, like tinctures and no, cures. No, just and just just working uh, out of not not like a, a retail something more wholesale, but just mm-hmm. doing. Import yeah. and export, and just bringing in furniture and exporting textiles, and just okay, all cool. that kind of stuff, and just you know following the market trends, and it's just it's real boring crap, and that's kind of what he's fighting for is to just return to mundane. Cool. Yeah, sounds good to me. So, how about the sergeant? What's his? What's the sergeant's name? Uh, what's their name? Okay, because I rolled it, and it was uh, Benjamin Williams. Because I I actually don't know my great great grandfather's real name because <laughs> I've just seen him in pictures. Yeah, um, but. His background is that he was a butcher. Uh, maybe, I guess, master butcher, what you call it, whatever. The person at a, at a slaughterhouse mm-hmm. slash yeah. butcher storefront. I'm gonna thinking about age. Uh, let's go late 20s. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little bit older, so that might contribute to why he was promoted faster. Uh, not like, you know, still, still of age to be in the front, but not... Maybe he's like twenty five. Okay, like you're that. you're still you're still young, but they yeah. see you as kind of savant. Yeah, um, and as far as background, anything else goes. So uh, we have that you distance yourself from the war by like looking at everything yeah. like a slaughterhouse. Yeah, and I was gonna say to tie it into that relative, half English, half Hungarian. Mm. So there's maybe I don't know if there's any prejudice yet because of the Austro-Hungary. Yeah, I don't know if, if I'm trying to determine whether or not he associates with that, or if, or if it's been brought up in the background, like if anybody's been speaking anything about him. But um, maybe whispers have been said back and forth. I the butcher, you know, as, as a mm-hmm. nickname, right? On, on yeah, field. well, I wrote down the butcher of Yeep. Yeah. There, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, or he he's the ghost. He goes in and cleans up the dead. Like it's just like, there's Ooh. rumors said that sort of thing. That it's like, oh, he's. It, it, but rea- reality, when you meet me, I'm jovial and friendly, you know, as, as a front and as an exterior to show, to, to hide that I'm really, really not doing so well on the inside. Right. But it's, it's just like, it, it's just this creepy thing. So it's like, oh, he goes out, he picks up the dead, he does, he, he cleans up, does all this, and, and then he laughs about it. You're yeah, like the Grim Reaper. Yeah. But maybe that laughing is almost like you drinking. Yeah. And- it's, it's like, like he's the boogeyman, the grinning Reaper. He, he's, it's like he's, he's, oh, Oh, they're sending in the boogeyman. Mm-hmm. Baba Yaga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little John Wick has to come into it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Uh, and and the bodies he buried that basically day. Basically, he's but... you know, re- recruited, recruited like anybody else. Just <laughs> And again, I, I would say that moved up fairly quickly because it was so easy for him to just deal with mm-hmm. what's happening on the front. Bill Williams, okay. right? Yeah. Ben, 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 uh, ben, Benjamin ben, Williams. Yeah, ben, ben Williams. Williams. Sorry, ben Bill Williams. Williams is from Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, ben, so Ben Williams. There we are. Because if it was Bill Williams, it would be Bill Bill. Bill yeah. Bill. That's not as menacing of a nickname at all. <laughs> hey, Bill Bill. Okay, so creative. Yes, so my name is Greg McQueen. Greg um, McQueen. I'm young. I'm probably, I, I would imagine 22, 23. So not, you know, as young as some people who were volunteering at the time. But I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not an old person. By any means at the front. Um, and I'm actually a reporter for the Mail and Empire, which was the precursor to the Golden Mail. Oh, mm. nice. Um, and the reason I'm on the front is because, you know, I was a young reporter in the newsroom and saw my chance to volunteer to go to France, report on something big that was happening in the world, maybe make a name for myself in the journalism world. And I've been here for five, four or five months. I reported on the aftermath of the this is after Vimy Ridge, right? It's after Vimy yes. Ridge, yeah. So I was sent to report on, you know, the change in command of the Canadian Army after Vimy Ridge, right? Because it was changed into a fully Canadian commanded unit after the big victory. And just seeing, you know, I came in with this sort of idealism. My 
earlier reports were very much like glorifying what the Canadian military was doing. And then after having been here for a whole summer, I've seen the horror of the of the trenches. And I've thought, you know, this story isn't really the one that matters. I think it, what matters is what's happening at the front lines. And so I've asked to be sort of re removed to this new position. Yeah. Mm. Do you know the Toronto Star original building it's, it's long since been demolished when it was opened up in the early 1900s it was all pneumatic tubes all the time to send everything around mm-hmm. including yeah. the world's only prototype for a human pneumatic tube elevator whoa <laughs> it ran for Big like drama. a week and then yeah. broke down and was never repaired broke but down the, and then somebody got stuck in the tube somebody no, got stuck. <laughs> but yeah. the blueprints are still in the toronto archives so they're still there, and do like have, there's drawings do they have of like it. A patent for it, so they could just bring it. <laughs> no, back I thought and bring it back now. If we ever did like a, if we ever did like a period game set in like 1920s, 1915 Toronto, that would be like I would have to have this. But it would newspaper be working. building with a working pneumatic tube. <laughs> could, could you just, imagine? <laughs> no, no, like, like there's, there's a subway, and then and as you. You look out like right beside the subway. There's tubes of people just shooting by. Just a Hyperloop 1920s edition. Just people are like so. pressed up against one side. It's going no, so fast. It was all steam powered. No, it's you, horrifying. You stand up there and it's like, there's oh like a, god. There's a person. Attendant's job is just to vaseline you up so you don't get stuck. <laughs> just no, I think you actually went like <laughs> into like a bullet shaped elevator. And then you'd press the button and go, oh. and then it would just push it was more you up on, on air pressure up to, and then you'd hit a cushion and it then was, you would open the, it was get the door out. Fun oh, for me. But it was a, like a cable-less elevator. Oh. That's terrifying. <laughs> it, was, it was more fun for me to think of it as like a water slide just that goes Anyways, 10, 20 kilometers. You're not from that. You're from the Mail-In Empire. <laughs> so it's completely different. Yeah. 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 All right, so we have our characters. Now we need bonds. And we need our bonds. We need mm. our bonds, and then our, our characters are done. And then our characters are done. We'll Character start the story is next actually episode. like pretty quick. You yeah, just yeah, we've been doing off. a lot of uh, side talk, but you know what? All the side talk though has been like about history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I guess that's that's a consequence of this game. You must spend a lot of time as a GM being like, let's uh, uh, do, get back to the game versus constantly pausing to be like history anecdote history anecdote history i like anecdote. that though yeah yeah, yeah. but yes mm-hmm. so bonds uh let's just go like in order again like uh patrick what's your first bond so my first bond is blank has done something to inspire me i see them as my muse um i was actually thinking al rice would be a compelling story for me right if i'm trying to go to the trenches and talk about all the horrific stuff that's going on um seeing someone who is trying to grapple with the fact that they're killing all these people Seems like it might be the what really I'm trying to get at as well. They're the sending you to write on, mm-hmm. write on Sergeant Williams, but you're actually interested in Rice. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. I don't think you would know about this poetry book, despite you being a writer. It's something that I would only use when I'm alone and isolated. Mm-hmm. Almost imagining you like maybe you're lying out in a crater in no man's land. There's gunfire going off. You see shells, and you're just like, oh, and you're just <laughs> writing. Sorry, I was leaving. Yeah, back I know in you're my chair. thinking back about it. Back you're, you're, we need you're headsets. Actually, you're actually. Uh, sitting in a crater and there's like a battle going on and you're just like writing poetry yeah 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 and just almost like white noise yeah in the background what's your first uh bond during the last trench raid i saved blank and they now trust me with their life hmm Mm. Maybe this... May- and now we could put NPCs here yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I like the idea. We've got we've got three questions. So one of them might go to an NPC because there's only two other players here. But I'm... I'm oh, sure. I, 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 maybe maybe it's McQueen. This, this like, you, 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 you showed up. You're here telling this story. And then very quickly, it's in over your head. Yeah. And it's mm. like, oh, wow. This is, like, <laughs> happening now. Yeah. But um, Al's been there. And... Uh, and there's this bit of like you're down in this dugout. There's bombs going around you, and then there's just a shadow standing over you, and a hand coming down, and then like let's get going. And it's just this fight or flight or freeze. And if you stayed there, and, and the minute I pulled you out and we started moving, that area you came from just turned into a crater. And yeah. then we moved out, and it was just you just got to keep moving. And that's why you, I yes, that's that's good the play muse thing, the, the muse thing, right? I see that as an inspiration for myself. Yeah, and it's what I want to write about. Oh, I like that. Okay, so Alex, what's your first? Uh... The section lieutenant is blank. My relationship with them is blank because. Ooh. So what's their name? This is an NBC. Okay, let's go with uh, Thomas Wright. Oh. Lieutenant Thomas Wright. 
Like uh, with a W. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And my relationship with them is brother-in-law. Oh, oh interesting. Even out here, you're pumping into people that you know. How <laughs> Toronto of you? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, Sergeant Williams, his brother-in-law. And let me think here. They died a few months ago <gasps> on a mission with us that I was in charge of. Oh, my God. So the former lieutenant the is... The former lieutenant. Is your brother-in-law... Yeah. Rip. Recently killed. Is he killed or is he MIA? Uh, okay. Uh, led the mission. It was a failure. I had to go in to clean up the battlefield. And found. Found him. Had to finish him. Take his stuff. Oh, wow. Oh, damn. Oh, geez. And that's what triggers the drinking at night. Oh, okay. That's and the first I, time you couldn't look at it and just be like, just first, like taking out an animal. So that's yeah. the first time. So everybody still thinks I'm this cold, hard guy and I have to put up that facade. Mm-hmm. But that broke me yeah. uh, initially. Ooh, I like that. Now, now they're not cows. Now, now, now they're all Thomas. I, I still put it up and people still think of me as the same, but they don't know, mm. I, they don't know I had to do that. Mm, that's rough. Wow. Like you, like he, maybe he was just like, he was dying and no, he he's, was, he's, he's holding it and he was hitting his liver. Yeah, you couldn't have. He's not going to make the, it back. I'm, I'm sent like they think I'm sent to clean up the dead, and there's no medics. Yeah, and he's hit. You know, these are you know lead casings. Oh, lead it's bullets. over. It's dead. Yeah. Right, right. And I can see it's in, and he's just like and he's he's going, do it. Yeah, and then you you couldn't, and then you you had to eventually do it to end his suffering, and then and that and, changed you forever. And collect everything, collect the artifact, and then I want to tie that in. Is that your personal item? My personal item is the wheel of cheese that he had. Oh, he had like a okay. wrapped up wrapped in up with paper. Yeah. Ooh. And how and how he's related because he's he's brother in law. We both worked at the same butcher shop slash deli. Oh, nice. This aged So he Shadar. Yeah, you know, he he worked, you know, it's store, pronounced Shadar. He worked Shadar. storefront. <laughs> I worked I worked behind. Oh, I like that. So this is like you lost a close friend and then this war became very human to you. All of a sudden this wasn't just some yeah. distant off place that you could just separate yourself but, from. But there's this myth around me that I have to keep yeah. up. Yeah. Mm. And does, does the rest and of And a spotlight on you because of the yeah. supporters. Yeah. Does the, even se- worse. the section doesn't know about this. No. This is mm. your secret. This is the one thing that I'm I'm hiding. Yeah. Oh, man. Because if they if they knew... I, I like would, a Jenga tower, we just keep pulling the blocks out. <laughs> yeah. Because, because, you know, law would dictate I was supposed to grab yeah. him and take him back, but I knew it wouldn't have made it. It mm-hmm. would have been worse. So I finished him off. Mm-hmm. Pat, what's your second bond? My second bond is Blank and I know each other from home. They help me obtain materials. And does Ben just know everyone here? <laughs> yeah, maybe he's an NPC. Are you like the most connected person in the Western Front? <laughs> I, I might make this an NPC, yeah. though. I'm thinking... Quartermaster? The quartermaster or uh, officer who's just around. Um, actually, maybe an officer would be an interesting one. I think my character, probably because he he's a journalist, he has a bit more of an affluent background, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and he knows one of the officers, because we're kind of near where the officers are, right? Yeah. This is a former officer's dugout. He knows one of the officers. Let's call him... Stanhope, that's a good. We we always use Stanhope. Yeah. Um, What's his rank? He is a lieutenant, yeah. not the section's lieutenant, but a lieutenant. Maybe he's the new one. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, he could be the new one. That that's why he's been assigned here because he's there to help me get everything I need to write this story. Nice. He brings us the wine. <laughs> 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 and I I'd say I probably know him from high school or something like that right it's but like a private school, private private school. school. Yeah, yeah it was a private private yeah. school In, writers you're yeah. both alma mater the of, upper canada college yeah something yes, like yes, that i just yes. realized we have like the saddest group of like if you set cheers the sitcom it's like all of our characters are like the saddest people that could possibly be in Cheers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> upper, Academy, upper, upper Canada Academy. Upper Canada yeah. Academy. <laughs> nice. Well, what's your next one? My next one. Uh, Blank and I often butt heads when strategizing. I mean, it has to be Ben. Oh, it has um, to be. Like Ben and I have such a different visceral idea of what this is. If I'm, you know, I just want to be alone and do what needs to be done from a distance. And Ben is like getting your hands dirty up close like 
out there collecting act like the dead like it's um there's like a corruption around you right and uh, uh and so the, the the way both of us would go into the same situation would, be, would have to be completely different. So and 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 even just in character creation, I've been going like, oh my god, well, <laughs> like, oh, like, no, like maybe, and and not all of that is me. Some of that is Al. So we've sort of been out, together like, maybe since the beginning, and we've seen everybody go, and we've gone you you like very separate ways. Yeah, but but, but but we are we work as a unit, even though. What I think is interesting is that despite your rank, Ben is still collecting like. The identity, the dog tags, the identity discs. Because uh, maybe I can't, I can't bring myself to assign anybody else. To exactly, do it. that's what I think a- is super interesting. That I'm, that I'm just where other other sergeants would would be scoffing, going, "Why are you still doing that?" Well, and, and I, that I, might be part of butting heads over the strategy. Is also part of you know, if if I saved McQueen, there's a bit of I I want to get out of this, I want to survive this, and part of it is as you're being moved up and being promoted, there are responsibilities that you you shouldn't be doing these things anymore yeah. because if anything happens to you, it's going to affect us. Mm -hmm. And there are places like it's kind of Star Trek. The captain can't go on the away missions, right? Like, like that's stuff that needs to be delegated because your place is on the bridge. And there's a place that you have in command that you can't be going out and doing this anymore. And I'm grabbing the trench. Or I'm going to be the one that's going to be left in charge. And I don't fucking want want that that. responsibility. (laughs) And, and, and maybe in, in in a sense, I know that. And go do it anyway because of that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you freak me out. I like that. What's your next one? Uh, my next one is I'm worried about blank because blank. I'm going to be worried about uh, the creative. McQueen. 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 Uh, because uh, we are one of the grittiest, <laughs> most difficult. <laughs> like we, 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 are, we are very in the shit for lack, lack of a better term and yeah and we, oh, you're 100 percent in the shit <laughs> to, to the point where i you know to be you you're, shouldn't be you're, here. You're, you're thrown in here and it's like it's like you've come here and you have all of your fingers and toes and you should not be here unless you are missing some of those for you to be thrown in with us mm-hmm. yeah you are well fed you are <laughs> clean and, yeah the opposite <laughs> and, and like, like no and knowing like and i'm also afraid that you're going to f- worried about you as a person but also worried that you're going to see there's a liability who, now. Who, we have to look out for you, and you're yeah. gonna, and you're going to see who we like. He you're going to see that we're, we're not this. We're yeah. not this glorious group that you think we in are, our, that, you're, um, that you're told to write about. And it's like you're going to see us do some shit. It's funny. That is in, horrifying. It's interesting. In our Night Witches game, we had a documentary crew show up at the airfield, and a co-pilot that had been killed. So they're like, "Well, we're just going to put the cameraman in the back of your plane, and you're going to fly around with them." But ultimately, they weren't going to get all those extra like mechanical roles as well. And also, you got to keep the camera guy alive because yeah. they're docu- and So there's this whole like extra complication. They're making that's a propaganda like, film. Like, yes, your job here is to write, and our job is to follow orders. And one of those orders is also to make sure you write your story and keep you alive. Yeah, and that's just a whole and give him something to write. Yeah, and it's mm-hmm. just this whole thing. Like, I don't want this. Yeah. This, this is more you're, responsibility. It's almost like you're a burden. Yeah, yeah. It, you you don't have a skill that we necessarily yeah. need. In a way, it's like I know you're not playing the replacement, but it does thematically have that feeling to mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, it does. Well, like, we, like we were hoping for somebody to come in and you know reinforce us. And instead, we got. You're not a soldier, you know. It's, it's like but it's even all though true. you, you well, even though you okay. might actually be enlisted, right? There were, yeah. You're, but, but you see, privilege, and you're like, yeah. Yeah. But if we have nicknames, if I'm if I'm the butcher or or whatever they want to call me, you're the paper boy. Ooh, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Ooh, and I think that fits in very well with my third bond, which is blank does not believe that my art has a place on the front lines. <laughs> oh damn, <laughs> Sergeant that ben. just answered itself. <laughs> yeah. Look at this, and that's a natural sort of that's that's your tension between us, and, the and that's how the like that in character creation, everything just kind of like comes together. Your moves, like, your concepts. I don't hate you, but like, are you going to go out there and stab them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like both of them might not even think that you have a place here because I mean, you saved him. Mm-hmm. So now that's also the I'm trying to prove my and my I saved worth. him because he was frozen. Yeah, and yeah. you're like not to you're if not you're okay so- with that. I'm kind of telling you what you did. You're not a soldier. You're yeah. a reporter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where, whereas you might not like me or be terrified of me, but you know, you don't have, if you turn your back to me, I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, can, I can hold my own. You can be. At least from what you've seen. At least yeah. I feel like I trust the people I work with, but I don't rely on them, mm-hmm. which is a distinction. There's this idea of the only person I feel safe on the road driving is myself. 
and it's like I a, know how you can me. love a family member but not like them. I know me, and I don't. <laughs> I just don't know. Like Ben's gonna get me killed. McQueen's gonna get me killed. <laughs> yep. So. You know you aren't gonna get yourself killed. <laughs> yeah. But, but if I do, at least it's my own fault, and yeah. it's my responsibility. And I only want me to be my responsibility. You like control. There's also yeah. that backside is Ben might be the one that has to kill me. <laughs> or finish oh me yeah. Off. <laughs> Because you've seen that where I've had to finish, you've had to finish yeah, other no people thanks. on the, not, not necessarily So I've got an interesting, this might but. be an NPC then. Um, Blank and I are the only survivors of an enemy raid. We survived because right in space below. So there's another character here that's not in this officer's dugout that is also nearby that we yeah. mm-hmm. work with and, 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 and have fought with. Could be like a like a lower ranking yeah. soldier. Maybe you got transferred into this new section. Yeah. Red. Red? Red. Just a kid. Right? Like um just uh just just some infantry kid who's mm-hmm. who who who's out there. And uh, it was one of those I'm out there writing poetry in a crater and uh when when something catastrophic happened and it was just the two of us were cut off and we survived together and uh it was one of those few moments where if i keep relying on myself to survive i'm not going to this kid might have been the one to give me the heads up and save me right Uh, and there's this um we survived because they threw me into the dirt or or found a shelter or got a place elsewhere and put themselves in the line to do what I had done to McQueen. I was just caught off guard. I was just not paying attention. Um, and so now there's this, the red is somewhere out there nearby. Who's also, uh, uh, we both, we both made it out of that. Nice. Nice. Like there's an ally in another section that you know of. A little red. Okay. What's your final one, Alex? Okay. I have blank has fought beside me since I joined the war effort and has my respect. Write a custom bond in your notes. I was originally going to put Al, but I've, I'm. Can I make this character a dog? Yes, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Okay, so then it's uh, Charlie the dog. So you guys have a you have a dog in your dugout because, and it would help me when I have to go find the dead. Basically, sniff out the another mouth to feed. Great. Yeah, <laughs> another, another another mouth to feed, but helps me sniff out things in yeah. the battlefield after when I have to clean yeah. things up. I wonder if red is even real. Uh, red, uh, I was just was thinking oh. it, just an extra detail. <laughs> um, his name, like this young kid, maybe he's 19, but snuck his age in yeah. uh, and, and, yeah. and, and applied a lot younger than he is, um, stands out because of bright red ginger hair. And even in like in the blasted wasteland of no man's land where everything's just mud and gray and crap. And then there's this fiery red head that yeah. just kind of just like pops out. Like it's like this orangey crimson. That's like, uh, that was one of the things that like, whoa, there's someone else out there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In, in the rain and the mud, you yeah. saw this thing. Yeah. And that's, that, that might be how I survived. It was just sort of, providence oh, but but like but that. because we were alone and spent that night and then i returned back later like i don't know is he friggin' the pokeru like i don't know <laughs> so yeah Ooh. <laughs> oh man that's good Are you, so, you, so you, you like have conversations with somebody that's in our in i, our, I, I have a, spoken of, i i of I, I, I now write like it's one of the poetries of this okay so you, right? you talk but, about this person but i've never seen this person. you've never seen this person you've never seen you, this you person. say it's from your first it's from it's from another assignment from another somewhere section, else, yeah. somewhere else this another person section may or may not nearby. Ever have actually existed or you might have yeah. seen the person one time they might have died in the first mission you but were you on. thought they were still alive yeah yeah i like that a lot yeah, yeah. okay that's super cool so those those are our three that's characters it. we're all set up we've got yeah. our we've got our group this uh you know what? And the story we tell is going to inspire all the folks back home to buy more war bonds and keep things going. And, <laughs> and by war bonds, that means back our game on Kickstarter. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, you can you can buy war bonds right now by clicking through the episode description. Ross Rifles is in Kickstarter right now. It's going to run through for the rest of the month. And if uh, if you like what you're hearing and you want to be a part of helping to build this game up and 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 make it into this fully fledged, fully printed game, uh, all those details are going to be there. Go check it out. Uh, and uh, the, like I said, the link is in episode details. You can also follow us on Twitter at Dice Warriors, where we will be updating sort of the status 
status of everything as well. So follow Dundas West Games because I'm sure they'll be doing it themselves too. Oh, yeah. And uh, and we'll keep you up to date. We are going to do every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, so uh, there'll be another, I don't know if this is on a Thursday or a Tuesday, so just bear with me here. We're recording at weird times in September. Um, uh, but we'll be doing twice weekly episodes uh so this is gonna happen real quick uh so we're gonna be back in our next episode with our first story hour yep. of this game with these with these uh three this trio this cadre uh in this dugout this officer's mess <laughs> yeah <laughs> dirty this, trio <laughs> instead of the dirty dozen uh, yeah. here we are the, this this triumvirate uh out out in no man's land um so uh, daniel i really want to thank you for for bringing this game to our attention and for coming to offer to run this game and and patrick for for coming to shore up our our room because this was a, a very last second decision yeah. so it was like oh no i how do i i gotta find some players to to join me on on a saturday uh and alex you you came all the way in from guelph to to, oh, wow. to come and play this kitchener. game with us or kitchener <laughs> sorry uh there used to be guelph um yes. and so so, uh, uh, so in, all the way in from Kitchener, which is even further uh, <laughs> to, to play this. So you're actually the one who actually feels like you've come on a boat and traveled across the Atlantic and landed yourself <laughs> in the middle of a trench somewhere. So Exactly. Yeah. What do I have to stab now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, really excited to see what happens next on our game. Um, so for Ross Rifles, I'm Justin playing the scout, Al Rice. I'm Alex playing the sergeant, Benny Williams, maybe Ben. Do I want to go something playful sounding it's a good contrast benny benny yeah benny it's like sergeant butcher. williams call me benny yeah it's like, nice no <laughs> <laughs> benny the butcher benny the butcher i'm patrick playing the creative greg mcqueen which yeah. in like if you survive yeah. five years from now you're gonna do real great in radio dramas yeah <laughs> really great <laughs> really great and i'm daniel on the gm and we'll see you in the next episode right here on terrible warriors until then Good to each other. Bye. Ross Rifles will return on Thursday with the second episode in our campaign. If you want to follow along with the success of the Ross Rifles Kickstarter, be sure to click through to the show notes where you can find a link to their campaign page. They already met their goal. They met it in under 24 hours, which is incredible. We are really looking forward to to what the success means for the future of Ross Rifles. You can follow us on Twitter at Dice Warriors, where we will keep you up to date on this campaign, as well as Root and Visigoths versus Malgoths, the other two campaigns we are promoting this month. And when we return on Thursday with our next episode in Ross Rifles, we get a mission to head out into no man's land. So return to us, won't you? Right here on the Terrible Warriors.